This morning we spoke today on day two uh, before the cross of, of Calvary and we are, uh, we wasn't able to finish this morning. I hate to stop in the middle of a, uh, of a message, but we needed to. And so what I would like to do tonight, I would like to finish what we were studying this morning. Some of it, I apologize, will sound like a repetitive uh, message. But please, I want to add some things to what I, to Mary and to also to uh, Judas that I wasn't able to add this morning. And so we won't be here very long, but forgive me if you feel like you've seen this part of it uh, before because you have a little bit. Let's turn to the book of John chapter 12. And I'm going, instead of Matthew, I'm going to stay in the book of John a little bit. I will go back. To Matthew a little bit, but I want to go to the book of John chapter 12 and look at John's account of this. Now we'll start reading in verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? And he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Tonight we again addressed the conversation between Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ. We today will look what right would he have to try to correct the Lord Jesus? What kind of arrogancy does he have? Well, we're going to study this tonight. Let's pray first. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to look into your word and to study it and to take it into our lives and to learn from it. Learn your love towards mankind. Lord, our understanding that we have a job to do. I do pray that you be with tonight's service. That Satan will not be able to steal the word away from anyone. Help our hearts to be ready to receive your word. Help me with my speech and my thoughts. Lord, give, it, give me clearness. And again, Lord, we do wait the day that we can come together. Once again, our prayer goes to our leaders. Lord, with compassionate hearts, we pray for their well-being and for their wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The true heart of Judas will come to light, as we've read. Judas' heart was not in the Lord's work, but his heart was in the bag that he carried. You see, a person may be able to hide their true intentions of their heart for a time, but all things will come out in the wash. Yes, we can hide ourselves and hide our intents as we come to church. Why do we come to church? Well, we should come to church to worship the Lord. But many people attend church for many different reasons. And we need to have our heart true because at some point it's going to come out what your true intent is. You see, his problem was he was angry of loss of money because of that spikenard that she took there was much there. It was much costly, the Bible says. 
He knew the price of it, as I said this morning. And it just aggravated him to, to no end, seeing that he thought she wasted it on the Lord Jesus Christ. In all actuality, everything we have should belong to the Lord. Everything that we have, we ought to be willing to let him use it through us in his work. We have our cars, and God's blessed us with cars. Some of them are a little bit better than others. Some have a little bit less trouble than others. But you know, God has given those vehicles more than to take us to work or to the store or to visit friends or go to the park. God has given us those cars to do his work. We have many other tools. We have a young man in our, in our church that's in high school. And he has a lawnmower business. And every year he comes and says, Pastor, will, will I be able to take care of the church yards this year? And of course, we're all old. And I said, yes, you can. Man, let the young people do it, amen? But what he has, he gives to the Lord. Many others have other blessings that God's given them. And they're always so willing to use it for the cause of Jesus Christ. Some people have abilities, the abilities of wisdom, and, and maybe they're able to uh, do mechanic work on the church buses or, or anything, plumbing and electrical and, and uh, uh, heating and air and, and cleaning, whatever God's giving you ability to do. You give it all to the Lord. Well, Judas, he did not like this. Because, let me remind you, his heart was not in the work of God. His heart was in the money. Truly, we see in a, a, a great example of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. And so many people misquote this verse. They say, money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not true. That's not what God's word says. If you believe your money is evil, bring it over here to the church. We'll pray for it, and we'll give it to missionaries and, and to the ministries of the church. But no, that's not what he said. He said the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, in our lives as Christians, sometimes money can mean more to us than our service with the Lord. We can let jobs that maybe we really don't need take place of God's time. We can let, let the pursuit of money take us and, and remove us from the, the work of the Lord. Money's good, and I'm not going to argue with you about it. It's nice to have it. I say so often around here, I have grand plans for Bible Baptist Church. All it takes is a lot of money. But, you know, money's not evil, but when we put it before God and we make it become our master, then we got a problem. You see, this is where Judas fell. He fell in loving the money more than he loved, the, uh, loved God. We know perhaps because God's salvation didn't reign in his life. You say, you don't believe that Judas was saved? I really don't. One might ask, how in the world can somebody walk that close to God and not be saved? My question is, how do people walk today knowing that there was a God above that loved them and a Savior that died for them, was buried and rose again? I don't want to leave him dead. And yet they don't accept his salvation. Oh, he was he was uh, uh, counted with the Christians. He ate with the Christians. He listened to Christ with the Christians. But yet he did not possess Jesus in his heart. Judas had hidden indignation, great hatred. We see people that have great hatred for the things of God. They have a heart problem. There should never be any hatred for the, for the cause of Christ. You see, 
True Christians are loving, but they're not going to let people step on them. True Christians are compassionate, but they're not going to let people take advantage of them. True, true Christians have a lot of love. And we need the love. But it doesn't mean that we're going to let people abuse us. We want people to come know Jesus Christ as their Savior so they can experience the same forgiveness and the same grace and the same mercy that God has given each one of His children. In the book of Mark, and again, I could stay here, but let's look at the other Gospels. In the book of Mark, if you'll join me in chapter 14, and in verse 4, the scripture says this. Now, if you're there, raise your hand. Are you there? All right. I'm trusting there's hands going up all over the United States. Here you go. The Bible says that they were in verse 3, that they were in Simon's home. And the lady came and she anointed uh, uh, the head and the feet of Jesus. And verse 4, And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? You see, ugliness comes from deep within. Ugliness is, is, is from the depths of the heart. When people are mean, they're just not mean just, just on the surface. But usually they're mean deep down in their heart. You say, well, how can you, how can you remove the meanness out of people? Or maybe I'm mean. I've had people say, you know, preacher, I'm mean. I'm really mean. I'm mean to my wife or I'm mean to my husband. I'm mean to my kids or kids will say, I'm mean to my parents. What causes that? Well, that's a heart problem. That's a problem that, that Judas had. And it went down deep into his soul. Now, some of the others around him, it didn't say all the disciples felt this way, but some of the others picked up the vibe of his, of his anger. And without thinking, they, they just fell into that, that walk with Judas. But let me remind you, we need to be careful with our walk, do we not? It spreads to other hearts. I know everybody's going to have a bad day. I have them. I'm not as always as sweet as you see in front of you. Ask my wife. Call her up. She'll tell you I'm not a sweetie all the time. I try to be, but I'm not. But I know that when I'm in a, in a, a foul mood, that it affects those around me. At our job, I try not to be in a foul mood. I get aggravated and frustrated as everybody else. But I don't try to linger there because it, 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 it brings bad vibes, if you please, to others that they can fall into it. With this, with this situation that we're in right now, there's a lot of unhappy people. They've been taken out of their norm. But... And I have, <laughs> i got to be honest with you, I get a little bit cranky. Can't get anywhere. You, you try to go and the stores are already closed. And thank you stores for closing. Boy, when I was a child, I remember stores did close at night. I remember stores not being open on Sunday. And we've got into a routine and a habit of having everything at our disposal whenever we want it. And you know, it's good that we can't get everything when we want it. It is good for us to discipline our life. But this indignation, it's easy to get caught up in the moment. And you've got, you have got to give God His place and He'll take that away from you. This is a good lesson that we need to learn to guard our hearts. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, can you join me quickly in the book of Proverbs? Psalms and then Proverbs. Proverbs, chapter 4. Verse 
Proverbs chapter 4. We uh, encourage dads to sit down with their sons every night for a month and take a chapter and read the book of Proverbs to that child, that son. Proverbs is a good book. You say, is it good for girls? Hey, let me tell you something. All the Word of God is good for everybody. But in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, did I tell you that already? Huh? I'm not hearing anybody. Oh, yeah, I forgot nobody's here. I got all these faces and everybody just smiling at me. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. The writer says, Keep thy heart with all diligency, for out it are the issues of our life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. My friends, today our hearts need to be guarded. What we take in, those that we are around, we need to guard our hearts as we're guarding something that's very uh, precious and priceless. We need to guard our hearts from the negative stuff of the world. We need to guard our hearts from the evil stuff of the world. And I'm talking to adults. I'm talking to young, young uh, uh, married and college and career people. I'm talking to our teenagers. Teenagers, if you know Jesus Christ as your heart, you need to guard your heart on what you take in, what you see. There's a little song that we used to sing as children. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, because it goes to the heart. We say, oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. All those things are tied to the heart. We need to guard our heart with all diligence. We need to protect our heart. We need to take in only those things that are good, that build us up, that will make us a happier people. What's sad today? I see young marrieds that are just so, so angry all the time. And they're not just the lost people. I'm talking about Christians. We see husbands and wives that are angry all the time. Can't find any happiness. What have you let into your heart? When you wasn't guarding it as you should, what did you let into your heart? We find teenagers. No respect of parents. No respect of authority. You see, what have you let into your heart? What, what did you drop down? What, what protection did you drop down to let your heart get in such a manner? You see, let's build up those fences. Let's put in those things that only pertain to righteousness and holiness. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to make a difference in your life. It'll make a life of peace. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect because we're not perfect. But it's going to get better. And the more you do it, the easier it'll get. The more that you guard your heart, the more you'll see things coming that's not good for you. You push it out. You say, well, you just want to be a bunch of Bible baddies. I'm not saying that, but by the way, what's wrong with being a Bible baddie? Oh, you just want to be pious gas bags. No, I don't want you to be pious gas bags. But what's wrong with being holy? Why do we have to look and act like the world and think like the world? When Jesus Christ has called us out of the world and he's put into us a new nature, why can't we be more like him? Why can't we be like the one who died for us? Why can't we sing the song, I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life will be. Why can't we have that? It's because we don't guard our hearts. We don't protect it. 
You know the only problem that Judas had in these disciples? The only problem they didn't have is they didn't leave their mouth shut long enough. When you see things, and, and God writes about this in the book of Hebrews, and, and if you'd like to turn to it, uh, uh, sometimes preachers get a hard time of, of them carrying on the, the task that they are to perform. And, and it's funny thing about being a preacher. Everybody knows the job of a preacher except the preacher, according to other people. Now, if a preacher would come up and, and tell, a, uh, tell a, a, a worker that does their job every day, you're not doing your job right. You need to do it like this. That person on that job, be it man, woman, boy, or girl, they're going to say, Preacher, bless your heart. You know, I love you and respect you, but you don't know what you're talking about. You've never done this. This is the way it's done. Can you imagine somebody who's never built a home? Try to tell a contractor on how to build a home? Well, I don't think you ought to do it like this. Well, you've got to do it like this. Well, why do you have to do it this way? Because the wall will fall in from the weight of the roof. Well, it's not that heavy. Yeah, but they don't have the sheet on it. They don't have the, they don't have the shingles on it. It gets heavier as we build it. Yet we have people tell preachers, preachers, you shouldn't do this. You, this is not the way you do it. Well, how do you know? How many, how many churches have you pastored? Well, God hasn't called me. Okay, let the preacher do his work. Judas should have been quiet and let Jesus do his work. Judas should have been quiet and let Mary do her work. Amen. Here's what the Bible says in the book of James, and, and this is where I'm coming from. He said in the book of James, verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. A pastor needs to present God's word, whose faith follow, considering the end of the conversation. Considering the end of the conversation. Considering the end of what is happening. When people get into trouble, all some folks know is half the story. And so they try to build the, uh, the decision on half a story. You can't do that. you got to have both sides of the story and then ask for godly wisdom. Pray for godly wisdom. Beg for godly wisdom. You see, they were only seeing one side. They saw the costly ointment. They saw the alabaster box. They saw it being poured on the king of kings, the Lord of lords. They didn't ask, why did you do this? All they saw, boy, there's some good money going down the drain that we could give to those poor people. You know where it would have gone? It would have gone into the bag. And Judas was called a thief. It would have gone into the bag. It wouldn't have gone to the poor. Consider the rest of the conversation. Jesus gives the answer to the rest of the conversation. He's not going to be bullied by Judas or anybody. Look, Jesus has loved these people. He's protected them when, when evil came at them. When they were struggling in a boat that seemed to be sinking, he came to their aid. And yet, they give Jesus fits. In Matthew chapter 26, he gives this answer. And I, I, I talked about it this morning, but I want to revisit it to make three points tonight, okay? Would you allow me to do that? Well, you don't get a choice. I'm going to do it anyway. You say, well, I'm going to turn my TV off or my computer off. Don't you do it. You stay right there. Amen? I might tell you something in a minute you want to hear. In Matthew chapter 26, I hope I heard some amens out of you like that. Did we get some amens? If you amen me, text me. <laughs> okay. Don't you do it while church is going on, though. <laughs> But Matthew chapter 26 and verse 10, the scripture says this. 
When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she wrought a good work upon me. I thought about this. Christ said she did a good work. My friends, in our lives, we need to do a good work for the Lord. I know I sing a lot, but we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. Amen. We need to do a good work for the Lord. Even though we're limited like we're limited, still we can do so much good for the cause of Christ. Amen. Then, number two, Mary's work is a far-reaching work. Not only was it a good work, but again, let me remind you, that work reached out a long, long ways. Our work. Sometimes we say, what we have to do for the Lord, it's, it's not very much. Hey, if it's done for God, it's going to reach a long, long ways. Amen. In, in this same book of Ma uh, Matthew, uh, uh, he said in verse 13, Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Isn't that what it says? Now, come on, follow me now. Some of you I know... I know probably just looked away for a little bit, but come on. Fairly I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the, what? The whole world. There shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for memorial to her. The whole world, it's far reaching. That little thing that she did that day with our God and our Savior, it's reaching out through the whole world. Preachers and missionaries and, and uh, uh, disciples of, of the Lord who just serve Him and love Him and, and teach people. They talk about the faithfulness and the love and the obedience and the care that Mary had. The same attributes that you and I need to have in our life. But I want you to understand, not only was her work good and not only did it reach far, but her work is eternal, is eternal. The things we do for God. Let's say we, we go out and witness, we go door to door. Maybe we talk to somebody at the park as, as we're there uh, uh, watching our kids swing. Of course, my kids, they're all older. I don't think they swing uh, on those deals because, man, I, I found out when I got older, those saddles, they don't feel too good. And those merry-go-rounds, they, they're not as fun as they used to be. And those slides, oh, those slides aren't fun anymore, you see. But while you go and you witness to somebody, and God puts you there at a certain time for a certain work, and somebody comes to know Christ, or maybe you was able to plant the seed, or maybe you're the one that watered, or maybe you're the one that brought the harvest in. That's an eternal work there. We know that her work is eternal, and I'm going to show you why. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, for me, I just turned a page. In verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away. But listen to this. But my word shall not pass away. Her testimony, her act of love was written in the word of God. And I'm going to tell you something. It is eternal it is eternal. God's word shall not pass away. But on Judas, his old heart, his old heart becomes hard and cold. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14, Then one of the twelve called Judas went to the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. You see where his heart was? He couldn't hide it any longer. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. When Mary anointed the head and the feet of our Savior. His true nature came bubbling out. It was a cesspool of, of, of evil. And so when he had the opportunity, he went to the, to the chief priest. 
with anger and probably in his heart, I'll show Jesus. How much will you give me for his life? Chief priest was ready to pay for that. They wanted him dead. Not only did they want him dead, you read, they wanted Lazarus dead because Lazarus was a testimony of God's supreme authority. He called him back from the dead and they wanted Lazarus dead as much as Jesus and Lazarus probably said, to them, you know, that's not going to bother me. I was there already and happy. Now I have to come back to this old world again and die again. Oh, they hated that. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, I'm almost finished. Stay with me just a moment longer. Please don't go anywhere. In the book of Luke, chapter 22. I miss hearing those pages rattle. In Luke chapter 22, I know some of you are rattling your Bible pages right now and laughing. But Luke chapter 22 and verse 3. The Bible says this, Then enter Satan into Judas, surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. You see, because his heart wasn't protected, the Bible says Satan entered into Judas. It seems to me that Judas's heart was way too easy of a door to walk through. He was just so willing to let Satan come in. As we go ahead, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. He, being close to Jesus, wanted to be the one to betray him. And they were glad... They were glad they made a covenant with him to give him money. Not only were they happy, but Judas was thrilled to death. Oh, oh, so you don't mind her pouring out a great deal of money over your head and feet. I'll show you. This is what Judas was saying. I'll show you. We'll get a price on your head. Let me tell you something. How do you sell Jesus? He's priceless. Well, they sold him for the price of a slave. Oh, Judas, oh, he thought, oh, I'm going to get him. How much will you give me? 30 pieces of silver. So the Bible teaches us that Judas sought for the opportunity. Again, in, the, in, in verse 6, he says, And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto, uh, unto them in the absence of the multitude. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, let's go back again just quickly. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 16. Matthew chapter 26, verse 16. And from that time on, he sought opportunity to betray him. My friends, he did not know Jesus Christ as his Savior. Although he walked with him daily, although they slept at the same campfire, although he sat underneath the teaching of his holy, his holy words that was exiting out of his mouth, he never accepted Christ. You say, Pastor, there's a reason for it. The reason is Jesus needed to die on the cross. He needed to, to uh, pay the price for the penalty of sin so we could get gloriously saved. Well, there needed to be a betrayal. But let me ask you, would you want to be the one who betrayed the God of the universe? Would you want your name associated that throughout all eternity? We know that Judas couldn't live with it. You say, well, he won. He got the money. But Judas couldn't live with it. But what we do sometimes makes it too late. My mom and dad always told us this. Sometimes when we make a decision to do something. 
They say when you make a major decision to do something, you better be ready to die with it because you might have to. And my friends, he made a decision and he died with that decision. Resurrection Day is just two weeks away, our celebration. Christians, are we sold out for God or have we sold out God in our life? Tonight, I think we need to get on our knees wherever you're at. You say, I'm at the park. I don't care. You afraid to let people know you're a Christian? Maybe you're in your home. But get on our knees and say, God, help me be sold out for you. Help me to love you. Help me to remember what you've done for me. Help me to start to guard my heart. Help me to push out the trash and the junk and bring in those things that are clean and good. Help me to have a right mind about me. The Bible says, let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Let me have the right atmosphere around me. Two days from the cross of crucifixion. Shall we pray? Our Lord, our God.